Theology with distinction from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. She has also earned the MA and PhD degrees in sociology, also from the University of Michigan. Currently, she is chief of the Center for Survey Methods Research at the U.S. Bureau of the Census in Washington, D.C. She has numerous publications, and in 1984, she co-edited Surveying Subjective Phenomena, the final report of the panel on surveying subjective phenomena for the Committee on National Statistics. Tonight, she will speak to us about implications of behavioral research on causes of census undercount. Dr. Martin. Thank you very much. I'm flattered and honored to be here. Um, I think the title of the talk is a bit misleading because um, implications is probably premature. I'm going to report to you, I want to tell you about some research and progress that's going on at the Census Bureau. Um, I hope it will cover the whole interest of the whole audience because it, is, it represents an attempt to combine qualitative and quantitative approaches to a problem that has resisted um, quantitative solutions, at least. I'll start off by giving you some background. The problem has to do with uh, census coverage, which you may be familiar with. Now this slide, which shows trends in net census undercount for different race, gender group groups, graphically, uh, thank you, graphically illustrates the problem faced by the Census Bureau. With each successive census, the Bureau has introduced programs to improve census coverage, and net coverage has increased for each group from 1940 to 1980. But despite these efforts, a pattern of differential undercount has persisted with black men having especially high rates. Critics have already, are already now charging that this historical pattern was repeated and may even be worse in the 1990 census, contributing to inequity in the use of census counts for apportionment, redistricting, and distribution of funds. Now in this slide, here you can see the very high overall rate of um, undercount for black men. In this next slide, You can see the very distinctive age patterning. If you look just at the bold black line. Um, in 1980, undercount of black males accounted for an estimated 38% of the total census undercount. And as you can see here, undercount rates for black men peaked in the adult years, with men in their late 30s and early 40s most likely to be missed. Now the undercount estimates in that bold uh, black line are based on demographic analysis, which compares actual census counts with expected counts based on data from previous censuses and data on births, deaths, and migration. Another method for estimating undercount is to conduct an independent post-enumeration survey and to match census reports to reports for the, from the survey to estimate numbers and characteristics of people missed in the census. Now, as you can see there, um, from the red line, the estimates based on the independent survey were lower overall and did not show the distinctive age pattern observed for the estimates based on demographic analysis. The difference between these two sets of estimates, and especially this area here, the area between the curves, points to the existence of large numbers of black men who are missed in both the census and the post-enumeration survey. Now roughly the same pattern of differences existed between these two types of estimates in 1970. Which I'm going to show you. The age breaks here are very crude so you can't really see, but you see that same big hump for the demographic analysis estimates. And it also existed in 1960.
All three of these are based upon comparison of demographic analysis against the post-census post independent survey. Now these figures that I've been showing you point to key, two key facts which motivate the research I want to tell you about. The first is the historical pattern of differentially high undercount of black males for the past three censuses, at least we have documentation of that, and it actually probably goes back over 100 years. The second is the difficulty of estimating undercount rates or understanding causes of undercount for this group. Demographic analysis points to the existence of large numbers of black men who are missed in the census, but tells us nothing about the causes of the undercount or the characteristics other than age or the location of these missing men. The PES, the Post Enumeration Survey, can't tell us about black men who are missed by both the census and the PES. Now the research I will be talking about is an analytic inquiry which seeks to identify and test causal hypotheses of why the undercount, and especially of black men I'll be focusing on, occurs. In contrast to both the PES and demographic analysis, it does not have the goal of estimating a national undercount rate or estimating undercount rates for any population group or geographic units of the country. <coughs> Now here, I'm going to be focusing on some of the research results for blacks in particular. And the reason for that is, first of all, there's a lot more research, and the size and uh, nature of the undercount is much better documented than for other groups. Um, and the other reason is that it's so important numerically. As I mentioned, the undercount of black men accounts for about 40% of the total undercount. However, the research program that I'm describing actually includes research on a number of groups where undercounts are known or suspected, including uh, Hispanics, um, Asians, undocumented, and homeless. Now, two leading explanation, which were explanations which were first suggested in the 1960s have been offered at the Census Bureau to explain the high undercount of black men. The first is that men may be missed because their presence in low-income households is deliberately concealed. A second is that men may be missed because of their uh, residency patterns and because of different types of household structures in low-income black households. The census attempts to enumerate people at their usual residence, and people who have tenuous ties to households or who move often are more likely to be missed than those at stable residences. In addition, housing units where black people live are missed at higher rates than housing occupied by whites. This factor contributes to the undercount of the black, black population as a whole, but it does not account for the differentially high undercount of black men. Now these explanations of concealment and mobility were first advanced in the 1960s, and they help account for why many people, including black men, are apparently missed by both the census and the PES. Nevertheless, the evidence on the causes is very sparse and indirect. And the problem, of course, is that to the extent these explanations are true, that it's difficult to gain ex direct evidence about people if they deliberately avoid surveys or if their lifestyle leads them to be missed from household-based surveys. Now, in order to learn more about the causes of undercount, the Census Bureau chose methods based on ethnography and participant observation. <coughs> Intensive small area studies conducted by researchers who live in and are accepted in a neighborhood may offer us a great deal of information about who's missed in the census and why for that particular small area. In the late 60s, the Census Bureau sponsored a pioneering study in a low income black and Hispanic city block in Brooklyn. This study, conducted by the Valentines, is the first uh, direct evidence that household members were de deliberately concealed from the Census Bureau. The ethnographers conducted a census of 33 housing units and submitted the results to the Census Bureau for comparison with rosters obtained independently by Census Bureau interviewers at the same addresses. For the 25 matched occupied housing units, the results were dramatic. Overall, 17% of the population and 61% of the adult men 
observed living in the sample households were not reported to Census Bureau interviewers. Fifteen male household heads were not reported by their legal or common law wives. The Valentines concluded that the female respondents deliberately concealed the men from the government to protect vulnerable sources of income in economically marginal households. When disclosure of the presence of a man could jeopardize household income from public assistance or from participation in legal or illegal or underground economic activities, then he was not reported to the Census Bureau. The Valentines found a widely shared perception of officialdom and powerful external agencies in general as exploitive and oppressive in their relations with the community. And they noted that the minimum of trust required for people to reveal themselves did not exist in that context. Now the findings from that study can't be generalized to any population because of the very small number of cases and the fact that it's not any sort of a sample. But the study convinced many people that deliberate concealment, deliberate omission, was an important cause of undercount. Now, since that first study, the Census Bureau sponsored additional qualitative research to explore the themes of fear of disclosure, economic and social marginality, and lifestyle or residency patterns as factors causing undercount. A qualitative study conducted by Hainer, Peter Hainer, in 1987 affirmed the importance his informants placed on consistently presenting an official version of household membership which matches records of government bureaucracies and which commonly omits men in order to protect household resources. Based on ethnographic work in Philadelphia, Elijah Anderson suggested fear and a sense of powerlessness as motives for concealment, noting his informants' intimidation by paper and fear of being written up especially by anyone in an official capacity. Philippe Bourgois finds many black and Puerto Rican people in East Harlem who believe a conspiracy theory which claims that there exists a conscious and systematic strategy on the part of the federal government and the rich to make living conditions intolerable for the poor and the non-white. He predicts that census undercounts will result from ideological resistance to and alienation from mainstream society and in contrast to the Valentine hypothesis, that straightforward protection of resources does not account for undercounts in the inner city. Now, motivational barriers to enumeration are compounded by the complex and fluid structure of many households who don't necessarily fit the Census Bureau's concept of a usual residence. Anthropologists working in black inner city communities describe large, loosely structured domestic units with rather flexible living arrangements, where they may be spread over several addresses. People may live at two or more addresses simultaneously and enter and leave households with some frequency. In such households, complete enumeration is difficult to achieve. For many people, it's unclear which of several addresses is their usual residence, so they may be enumerated more than once or not at all. Others may slip between the cracks because they have no usual residence at the time of the census. The census form instructs respondents to include on their roster anyone staying there on census day who had no usual residence, but we don't know how reliably such people actually are included. Eleanor Gruber, a cognitive anthropologist, conducted intensive interviews to learn how her low-income respondents decide questions of where someone lives. Her interviews with female informants suggest a different mo motive for leaving men off of census rosters. Women with leases may prefer to keep the male off the lease as well as other forms of documentation and in a marginal status in order to retain control of the living space. She also found that when life circumstances are complex and ambiguous, her respondents used various criteria to determine residency, including a person's intentions and agreements, where they kept their belongings, where they got their mail, and other considerations that don't have any place in the Census Bureau uh, definition of residency. These calculations may lead people to leave off marginal people who should be included according to the Census rules. For example, she devised vignettes based upon actual situations her respondents told her, and she found that most of her informants would not include Mary as described in this vignette. 
Mary asked her friend Helen if she could stay with her for a few days while she looked for a place of her own. It's been five months since then. Mary's suitcases are still packed and are at the front door. Should Helen count Mary as usually living there? Gerber's informants didn't, but the census says you should. Gerber's hypothesis of marginality is supported by analyses by Robert Fay, indicating that a marginal relationship within a household predicts inconsistent reporting of a person in the census and an independent survey in the same household. People with marginal relationships to the household, such as boarders, were much more likely to be left off either the census or the survey roster than people who are more central. Some of the race differential in coverage may occur because black households include more people, especially males, in the categories of relationships which are less consistently included. Now the qualitative exploratory research sponsored by the Census Bureau has suggested several ra related but distinct causes of the differential undercount of black men, including protection of household income sources, alienation from and resistance to mainstream society, gender relationships, and different household structures and residency patterns for the black population. A number of these factors are themselves direct or indirect cause consequences of poverty and economic marginality, factors also known to be correlated with undercounts. Now since this first pioneering study by the Valentines, there have been a series of studies to evaluate census coverage of small areas along the lines of the original Valentine study. These studies have been conducted in conjunction with the test censuses leading up to the 1990 census, and they've replicated and extended the methodology of the original study. And I'd like to tell you about how this research has evolved as it's gone along in the course of the 1990 cycle. The first uh, set of studies was a free site study conducted during the 86 test census of Los Angeles. Ethnographic enumerations of three sites were conducted in predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods. The Los Angeles studies improved on the earlier Valentine's study by incorporating more standardized procedures for matching the census against the ethnographer's results and by replicating across multiple sites. The research identified several factors associated with undercounts in the 86 test census including irregular housing and illegal conversions of housing, undocumented status of the residents, Spanish language, and marginal relationships within extended family households. A major problem with these studies was that the ethnographer's enumerations were conducted several months after the census, and mobility into and out of the sample blocks was not explicitly and systematically taken into account. The method was further tested and modified in the 1988 dress rehearsal census with studies implemented in five sites. These projects incorporated three modifications in the methodology. Ethnographers were asked to document census day residents for all persons enumerated in order to account more systematically for mobility. Again, however, the alternative enumerations were done four to six months after the census, which limited the ethnographer's knowledge of the outmover households. Second, a field follow-up stage was implemented with the researcher returning to the field with the matched results to investigate, resolve, and document reasons for the discrepancies between the two enumerations. The third change was that in one of the 88 sites, we tested an overlap with the post-enumeration survey where PES interviewers conducted a third independent enumeration of the site. Now in the dress rehearsal census areas of Eastern Washington State, St. Louis City, and South Central Missouri, sites were purposefully selected in areas where coverage problems were expected to occur. At each of five sites, the ethnographers selected two whole census blocks, about 100 housing units total as a sample site. They conducted their alternative censuses of their two block areas several months after the census, and their lists were matched to census forms for the same blocks. They were asked to document census day residents for all people they observed living on the sample blocks at the time of their enumeration, 
and to record which persons had moved in after census day. After the, their results were matched to the census, the researchers returned to the field to investigate, resolve, and explain any discrepancies between the two enumerations. In the field follow-up, the ethnographers sought evidence to confirm or disconfirm the census version of the households. In cases where the ethnographer had reported an entire household was moving in after the census and no contrary evidence about the prior household was available, the household reported on census forms was arbitrarily accepted. This convention gave the benefit of the doubt to the census in the case of outmovers about whom there was no information available except the census. Now, a number of people who moved in after census today nevertheless were matched to census records. This can easily happen if a household doesn't respond to the census and the enumerator comes out during non-response follow-up and enumerates the people who happened to be living there at the time <coughs> but who weren't living there on census day. Now, the five sites in the study include the Colville Indian Reservation, a mixed neighborhood in South St. Louis, which includes Laotian refugees, whites, Hispanics, and blacks, an inner-city black neighborhood in East Central Missouri, a black urban neighborhood in North St. Louis, and a Hispanic farm worker community in Eastern Washington State. Of the 10 sample blocks, seven were completed and provided usable data. The Hispanic site had to be dropped because the researchers didn't record census day residents and couldn't return to the field to resolve discrepancies. Another block could not be resolved due to the high mobility of its college student population, and it was also dropped. Now, before I present some results from this uh, dress rehearsal research, I should note the limitations of these data. The first being that the seven blocks don't re represent a probability sample in any sense, and the numbers of cases are quite small, so the results can't be generalized to any population or group. A second limitation is that this dress rehearsal study represents an intermediate point in our attempt to bridge the cap gap between qualitative and quantitative research. The data were not collected using any standardized instrument or set of specifications. Explanations of discrepancies were in the form of detailed case-by-case -case narratives, in one case including a complete photographic inventory of all the census omit missed house housing units. Now, the diversity of the materials, which then were coded, does raise questions about comparability in some instances. Third, the comparisons I'll show you are based primarily on census forms, and so they don't reflect census imputations or any changes made during local review or the other stages of census processing. So for all these reasons, the results should be considered illustrative. Okay, now the first... presents the results of matching uh, after resolution for all seven blocks. 594 matched persons were identified by both the census and the ethnographers, and 286 non-matched persons were identified by one or the other, but not both. Now, of the non-matches, 143 were accepted as correct census enumerations. This category includes both cases in which the ethnographer was able to gather additional information to confirm the original census version and cases in which the census enumeration was accepted as correct because there was no contrary evidence. Census omissions are individuals listed by the ethnographer as census day residents but missed or enumerated elsewhere in the census. All 85 cases were confirmed as omissions by evidence gathered in the follow-up fieldwork. Census erroneous enumerations include geocoding errors, as well as persons who lived outside the sample blocks. All of these cases were also confirmed. So for these seven blocks, we find a gross census omission rate of 12.5% and an erroneous enumeration rate of 7.3%. These gross error rates are almost certainly underestimates. The several months lag between the census and the alternative enumeration meant the trail had gone cold for many outmovers, 
and the benefit of the doubt often was given to the census version in such cases. The effects of this design weakness can be seen in this table. which presents the census enumeration status of all persons according to their post-census day mobility as determined by the ethnographers. Note that about 94% of the persons identified by the ethnographers as having moved in or mostly moved out uh, after census day were correctly enumerated by the census compared to 84% of persons who didn't move. Now since we expect and we, we know that there is better census coverage of non-movers than movers, the high rate, the 94% rate, of census coverage for movers is counterintuitive and it is probably an artifact of the way the study is carried out. It reflects the fact that the study, as it was done, was not well suited to identify residentially mobile persons who are missed or erroneously enumerated in the census. Now more than half the people who were missed were missed because their whole household was missed. Most of these, most whole household emissions, occurred because a housing unit was misclassified by the census as vacant, about half were due to that cause, or because the address did not appear on the master address list for the block, about a third were due to that cause. These housing units were either entirely missing from the address list used by the census, or they were misgeocoded to another block. The ethnographic data suggests that many housing unit coverage errors occur because of deviations in address and building types in areas which are dominated by a regular pattern. This factor affected sites in parts of urban St. Louis City, where much of the housing is two flat attached row houses. Units missed or erroneously enumerated in these areas were those that broke the repetitive pattern, either because the two units were reconverted to one housing units or because the flats had been further subdivided. One of the researchers reports that in South St. Louis, it's common for older owners of two family flats to live in one unit, usually the second floor, and leave the other unit empty for security reasons. Since the person owns both units, uh, he or she may give either address as the residence. Um, the researcher found several such households were enumerated <coughs> twice, once by mail return, and again when the census enumerator came back to call at the non-existent, non-responding second unit. Now in the 86 test census in Los Angeles, ethnographers found that people were missed because they lived in illegally added or converted units which didn't appear on the census lists converted garages, back houses not visible from the front and with no mailbox and so on. This type of missed unit wasn't found in the 88 sites, but the missed converted units in Los Angeles share a trait in common with the missed and erroneously enumerated units in North and South St. Louis, which is deviation from the norm set by the examples of addresses and building types in the immediate environment. A false assumption of homogeneity underlies this class of error. For errors of this type to occur and persist, an assumption of homogeneity had to have been shared by the vendors who prepared the commercial address list which the census purchased, by the census takers who, sh who checked them, and by the enumerators who enumerated the false addresses. Census procedures may be vulnerable to relatively minor variations in housing patterns which prompt errors of omission and inclusion. Possibly vendors and census listers both rely too exclusively on addresses to determine the number of housing units. Now, 40% of the census omissions occurred within households. And these cases, these omissions include both cases of concealment and of ambiguous residence, as we had expected. And now, most census omissions of white persons were due to missed households, 85%. Let me show you the next slide.
This gives you the whole household omissions for race, gender groups. Now, in contrast, uh, only 60% of black omissions were whole household omissions. Um, in this next slide, I'll show you the within household rate. Note here especially the relatively high rate of within household omission of black men, which contrasts with the pattern for other groups. These results are quite consistent with prior research findings, although the higher total omission rate for whites in this sample is not consistent. Generally, uh, whites have better coverage than they do in this sample. However, the, whites, the white people who are found in these seven blocks are atypical of the white population in general in that they live in racially mixed areas, which the vast majority of the white population does not. Many of these were elderly homeowners still living in neighborhoods which other whites had deserted. Now for both black and white residents of the seven sample blocks, gender was clearly linked to within household omission, as you can see in that slide there. And perhaps more here. This gives the numbers of uh, black and white um, omissions for males and females, whole household and within household. And what you can see is that black and white men were slightly more likely to be missed because they were left off of household rosters than because the entire household was missed. They were about equally likely to be left off of mail return questionnaires and enumerator return uh, returns. In striking contrast to the situation for the men, black and white women were missed in the census only if an entire household was missed. Only one female in our entire sample was left off a household roster for the black and white um, men and women. Now, as I mentioned, the census omissions include both cases of concealment and ambiguous residence. There were several cases of female respondents failing to report and in some instances deliberately concealing the presence of adult men who were their unmarried partners. Concealment ap appears to explain the case of one woman who filed a male return under her maiden name and listed three sons as members of the household. The ethnographer reported the woman as living with her two sons and their father. The name given for the third and apparently non-existent son was the father's name. Neighbors referred to the woman by her married surname. The woman herself wouldn't discuss her interpretation of the household with the ethnographer, but the male householder confirmed the ethnographer's version of the household is unchanged over the previous eight years. Now, in this case, concealment resulted in mis misinformation, but not in an omission. The man was reported in the guise of his son. In only one case is it apparent that the presence of a man was concealed in order to protect household resources. This is the case of an American Indian woman who omitted her co-resident male partner. Because he was not enrolled on the reservation, technically he did not have the right to live in the tribal housing project where she lived. This unique case is actually the only known example of a respondent in the 88 sites who may have omitted a person to protect household resources. Now the few clear cases of concealment of men which turn up in our sample blocks are interesting in that in several instances, the woman's unwillingness to report a man was not shared by the man himself. In some cases, men more openly acknowledged their residence in households than the women who failed to report them. Instances such as this have turned up in previous ethnographic studies as well. In the original Valentine study, the pattern was for men, women not to report their husbands, although the Valentines report no evidence about the men's willingness to report themselves. Hainer reports a dramatic instance of a male whose desire to be acknowledged as husband clashed with his wife's economic need to conceal his president, presence, leading her to throw him out of the household. 
Eleanor Gerber hypothesizes that some women leave male partners off the roster, as well as leases and other documentation, in order to keep the men in a somewhat marginal status and keep control of the living space. We're going to investigate the possible effects of gender reporting differences further in our 1990 study. Now, ambiguous residence also turns up as a factor explaining coverage errors. We previously discussed the pattern of a family spread over several neighboring housing units which constitute the living quarters for a household that may rearrange almost daily where people eat, sleep, and care for children. This kind of living arrangement characterized some of the households studied in St. Louis and accounted for several cases of double counting of older black women. In both cases, the woman was enumerated by the census as the mother or grandmother in one household and as the principal household at an adjacent unit. Now it's interesting to speculate that the same type of household arrangement may simultaneously lead to overcounts of black women and undercounts of black men in the same sort of extended family households. This would contribute to very skewed sex ratios for the black population to the extent that it happened. And of course the sex ratio is one of the factors that the demographic analysis takes into account to estimate the size of the population that's missed. This is another hypothesis that we're going to examine further in the 1990 studies. Now based on the experience of the 88 dress rehearsal pilot studies, we refined and revised the methodology to be used in a full-scale ethnographic evaluation of 1990 census coverage, which has been expanded to 29 sites of about 100 households each. Five groups in which undercounts are known or suspected to be high are represented. Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, American Indians, and undocumented residents. Using purposive methods, sites were selected in three types of settings. Racially or ethnically homogeneous urban sites, racially heterogeneous urban sites, and racially or ethnically homogeneous rural sites. Now from a methodological point of view, an important finding of the 88 dress rehearsal pilot study was the differential quality of the five sites. One factor was inconsistency in definitions and methods across sites. The 88 researchers were given minimal guidelines and were allowed to experiment. Some developed strategy and methods which were subsequently incorporated in the study. But in order to improve the comparability and the quality of the ethnographic data, a training and orientation conference was held for the principal investigators from all the sites to train them on census definitions and geography, procedures for the alternative enumerations and field follow-up, and conventions of recording data. A clear limitation of the 88 pilot studies was the long time lag between the census and the alternative enumerations, which limited the ability of the ethnographers to identify residentially mobile people who were missed or erroneously enumerated in the census. The 1990 study improves on the 88 study in this regard by requiring that alternative enumerations be conducted or have been conducted during a six week period within six month, three months after census day. However, this gap of up to three months is still very far from ideal. The obvious, most desirable procedure would be to conduct the alternative enumerations simultaneously with the census. Now, as in the 88 study, the results of the matching will be returned have been returned to the ethnographer for field follow-up to investigate and resolve discrepancies. This time, however, the ethnographers will document the resolution and reasons for the discrepancies according to a more standard format. The researchers also will collect more behavioral data about individuals, households, and the neighborhood, including a core set of comparably defined measures related to mobility, language and literacy barriers, concealment, irregular housing and household arrangements, and resistance. Finally, at four sites, there's a double-blind overlap with the PES, which will yield a third independent <coughs> enumeration of several hundred households. Currently, the field work is almost completed. Only four sites are still conducting their resolution follow-up, and the other sites 
the final stages of the data collection are being processed. Now the goals of this 1990 study are several. The major goal is to provide direct evidence documenting census coverage errors and to describe patterns of undercount and overcount and examine possible behavioral causes. This information can inform the design of future census <coughs> methodology. For example, it seems clear that there needs to be some examination of the residency rules and concepts that are used by the Census Bureau so that they can be adapted to design a census that includes people who don't fit the uh, Census Bureau assumption of a usual residence. The causal factors which are found to account for these coverage errors can also be considered as variables, post-stratification variables in modeling uh, undercounts for the post-enumeration survey. Although I don't know if that will be done this time around, it could be done in the future. And in fact, the results of the ethnographic study provide an independent source of corroborating evidence which, while it's not based on, or on a probability sample, can be and probably will be used to comment on and shed light on the results of the post-enumeration survey. As we've seen, the PES studies of the previous decennial censuses have failed to account fully for the differential undercount of adult men and especially adult black men. The ethnographic studies may furnish information about the characteristics of persons which are prone to, the ineff prone to ineffective treatment by PES and it probably will be examining within household omissions and especially within household omissions of non-movers where the ethnographic results may shed light on the post-enumeration survey. The other place where the ethnographic results may be useful in conjunction with PES is that there's very little information existing about the extent of correlation bias between the post-enumeration survey and the census. And this won't provide generalizable information, but it will provide some information about that because of the overlapping blocks in the PES. Now I might close by just making a sort of more uh, couple of comments about um, how I see the advantages of this type of research and the problems of it. It's clear, it seems to me, that the tremendous advantage of this kind of research is its sensitivity to cultural diversity and local variations in residency patterns, housing units, addresses, naming conventions, um, the sort of basic facts about living, living arrangements that have a very powerful impact on how the census actually works in any given area. Um, the disadvantage is almost the mirror image of that, and that is the difficulty of achieving comparability and um, perhaps the best word would be discipline. The bias of the observer or the potential bias of the observer is very great because typically the ethnographic research, the, um, the researcher is the interviewer, the data interpreter, you know, he, he or she is in the central position of devising the hypotheses, collecting the data and interpreting them, and whatever bias exists in that position uh, is, is hard to control for, I think. The survey researcher um, there's a great discipline in having to devise standard procedures that are removed from yourself, which are used to filter the data before it gets to you, so, and then to apply the inferential, the apparatus of inferential statistics to those data, place great limitations on your ability to <laughs> see what you want to see in the data. The problem with the survey method is that the bias of the observer can be built in in hidden ways and the, the procedures themselves are based upon assumptions which may not fit the situation, assumptions that the researcher imports into it 
and that the data don't tell you where you went wrong. So there's a, a great uh, sort of contrast and um, difficulty in trying to bring these two together. I think I'll close there, and if you have questions, I'd be glad to answer them. As a matter of fact, um, in South Central Missouri, um, the researchers who were black were going into an area that was mixed ostensibly, and it turned out to be predominantly white, and they had a very difficult time getting cooperation in that area. Um, in that, st that happened. I'm just curious how, um, how you recruit and train ethnographers. Hmm. Well, um, in this study, we did it largely by word of mouth. You know, we knew the areas that were in the census, and we began searching for people to work, searching in local universities for people who might be interested in working on this project. In the 90s study, it was done more systematically, where we advertised in um, sociology and anthropology newsletters and solicited proposals. And in 90, we required that they had to have some kind of established ongoing relationship in the community of some sort, whether it be already existing research they were already doing or that they were connected with some kind of social service agency. to me that there was only this, I mentioned there was one case of concealment to protect resources in our sample. I don't know if that's because that's all there really was or if there are also limits on the ethnographer's ability to find out. 